I'm going to try to see if I can cover just the basics of what we have been done in the Bushmeat initiative that I'm part, I've been part for almost two years, or more than two years. But Bushmeat um, issues, it's been part of the C4 research agenda since C4 was established. And C4 scientists, they are key um, scientists that were part of the discussion about bushmeat and the biodiversity crisis for as long as I think some of you were not born yet. And one of them is Robert Nassi. I don't want to say Robert Nassi is becoming the grandfather of C4, but Robert Nassi is one of the leading scientists in the bushmeat issues, particular in the link between bushmeat and the well-being, human well-being. And I believe all of you already read his paper, his most famous paper uh, about um, empty forests, empty stomachs, where he addresses the issues of livelihood, food, and income for smallholders. C4's Bushmeat initiative is characterized because focus more on small smallholders, the well-being of smallholders in tropical regions. Um, that actually helped us to address this global issue now, the global food, food and nutritional security. And I believe food and nutritional security open a new, new doors, open new doors for looking at the issues of uh, sustainable hunting, sustainable consumption, and sustainable trade of bushmeat, which it, during the the crisis of biodiversity was condemned by some people, some scientists, was endorsed by other scientists. But the, the dispute, the issues of sustainable bushmeat is still on the table, and I think C4 has a lot of things to contribute there. But the sustainability of bushmeat as a source of food nutrition and income is different uh, if we see sustainable bushmeat as part of the biodiversity crisis. And, um, I think the part, particularly the inclusion of livelihoods, the inclusion of sustainable environments or landscapes to address the issues of uh, bushmeat um, harvesting is, is very challenging and challenge a lot of what we've been said as part of the biodiversity crisis. Um, particularly, I think you cannot answer the issues of sustainability by measuring or by uh, talking about the importance of diversity of game species, the composition of these populations of game species that a lot of biodiversity assessments have produced. Though in C4 we use a lot of biodiversity data, and there are a lot of information. In some ways, I would be, um, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to know that in many countries where we work, there is very, very good databases on biodiversity. Wherever, even in Congo or in Bolivia, you do have large data sets not just in the conservation groups, in the tangos, in the usual suspects, but also at the government levels. Brazil is perhaps the most advanced. You get really nice sets of data on biodiversity at the municipal level. So there is a lot of information on data, on, on um, game species, compositions, habitat, but that's not enough to answer the question of sustainability. What C4 can bring is to look at the issues of behavior, household behavior, and what we call more is landscape transformations or landscape conversions. Two issues that might help us to answer 
uh, or to find ways of sustainable bushmeat harvesting, consumption, and hunting. Let me tell you just a couple of things that we found in a review. We've been engaged in a global review and regional review and national review on publications and reports on bushmeat hunting in tropical regions. Um, and 2,650 papers we have reviewed and 768 reports. And again, um, starting with Robert Nassi, there is no doubt that bushmeat is indispensable for the well-being well -being of humans and environments. So, but um, that question has to be connected to what we are doing with that what we are doing with the habitats, with the environments, with the landscapes, and the uh, food income of these people. In some ways, let's talk about the sustainability, what we call, and Grace already mentioned, the socioecology of the bushmeat. Um, but uh, bushmeat is one of the many sources of food and income for smallholders. Uh, in very few cases, very few um, experts talk about the total dependency of food or income of smallholders on bushmeat. Dependency on food and income for bushmeat, on bush, bushmeat is more an exception than a rule by smallholders. Smallholders are hunters, are agriculturalists, are farmers, are loggers, and they work in, in Paris, they work in New York. They have a huge sources of income, um, not just depending on bushmeat. But that doesn't mean bushmeat is not in the, in the spens indispensable for the well-being. Also, um, in a very few exceptional cases, smallholders are hunting only in forests. Majority of cases, smallholders are hunting in mosaic landscapes, in house gardens, in fallows, in agriculture fields, and large volume of the biomass, or hunting biomass, the offtakes biomass in places like Ecuador, Bolivia, in the frontier areas come from hunting in these landscapes, in these mosaic landscapes. Again, few exceptions, farmers, uh, smallholders are hunting in forests. Um, also, the literature shows that hunting, the unsustainability of hunting, is more an issue of land use changes. It's more an issue of losing habitat, particularly in tropical countries where engaged in large commodity production. It's more that issues of uh, how we use the landscape rather than overhunting how people are hunting. And so that also shows how, how we have to address the issues of sustainability, not just following the hunters, but perhaps following the old palm planters, the soybean planters, that are what they are doing, understanding what they are doing, how they are incorporating habitats within their Plantations is perhaps one of the questions that we have to look for. So definitely, bushmeat is definitely on the menu of rural and urban people. It's st still there, and we have to see how we can um, provide information, but governments can keep this as an important resource for to deal with food security, food and nutritional security. As conservation laws are enforced, consumption, consumption and trade of bushmeat becomes more clandestine, does not eliminate. And I would like to know from you, you probably have more experience telling me law enforcement left to 
more sustainable hunting. And we didn't find in the literature, we didn't find in the interviews and the field work with that. What law enforcement did or does is produce this kind of bushmeat, clandestine bushmeat in the area. And so um, that makes very difficult for governments, any kind of governments for monitoring bushmeat consumption and trade in towns and cities. Hypothetically, we think this is increasing. Clandestine bushmeat increases ra rather than reduces the consumption of bushmeat in towns and cities. But at the same time, there are some positive steps in, in what governments are doing. Um, we found, for instance, in Brazil and Ecuador, that uh, smallholders are using, are investing their social pensions, cash money, cash income that they get from the social pensions. In Brazil, what they call the Fome Zero programs, po poverty reduction, and in Ecuador, these socio bosque programs, they are investing there in restoring what we call hunting landscapes. In many ways, they are open less areas for planting annual crops. They have enough cash to go to the supermarket and buy tomatoes produced in Australia. And they don't have to keep cutting forests and producing food for tomorrow. So they are capable of engaging in land use system, in long-term land use systems like agroforest and forest management, redesigning or, as I said, restoring the hunting landscapes and forest in the area. So these are steps, and my colleagues from the Brazilian and the Ecuadorian government really now are trying to appreciate how investing in social programs is not just leaving people from poverty, but also improving the sustainability of environments. And that's part of economies like my colleague, Emmy. Echoids should look at more carefully is not just the money and the dependency of the smallholders on government programs, but also the, the value of this investment in providing or restoring sustainable landscapes, sustainable environments. So this is just an introduction, a brief introduction of what we are doing in the uh, Bushmeat Initiative in C4. Um, as I said, we do this work in C4 more than two years, spending, collecting information. We also build networks. The issues of Bushmeat is, are very complex, and we need to have the best of the best in terms of expertise, in terms of institutions, to continue our work in C4. And I believe C4 if you read the reports, if you read what um, John Colmey does in the communication systems, Bushmeat appears and disappears, but still there. So, um, but we had to keep building the networks. Right now, we have a very good network of experts and institutions dealing with Bushmeat. Um, I'm just going to suggest, mention some ideas that what we're trying to explore, we're trying to do as the Bushmeat, how, how, what will be the focus on this Bushmeat initiative at C4. One is to see Bushmeat as a source of medicine. Um, and the question will be, what are, sorry, I had to, I had to turn, yeah. What are the opportunities and constraints for sustainable harvest of bush meat and other wildlife products created by the demand of alternative medicine. Alternative, alternative medicines everywhere. We are not talking about traditional medicines anymore. What New Yorkers get from the alternative medicine might have an impact on the sustainable harvesting of bush meat in Laos or in Cambodia. Let's look at what the opportunities are there. Hunting landscapes, we have to see what are 
this hunting landscape, this emerging landscapes, <coughs> what they, in terms of their, their habitat, in terms of how people are managing these hunting landscapes. Hunting landscapes are not anymore far away from the cities. The peri-urban areas are providing very important part of the bushmeat that's consumed in the towns. Let's look at that. Food and income sources, what is the contribution of bushmeat and other game products on to the food systems and income sources or smallholders? Um, it's still an issue that being explored many times. Um, I think we had to try to look at more carefully that, rather to look beyond these long questionnaires that some of our colleagues in Penn have implemented, but providing much more in situ observations and getting more information from the field. The process of defaunation and foundation also, I'll be recommend to see how bushmeat harvesting can help to restore large landscapes that are now called degraded or, or uh, um, in some ways we can also greening the tropical areas. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, for this brief, but I think really interesting spotlight on the complexity of the bushmeat issue. Are there any questions from the audience? If there are, could you please stand up uh, before you ask a question because you need to be captured on camera. Yes, Stephen. Thanks, Miguel, for the presentation. I, I, my question relates to questions of, uh, I suppose, management of the bushmeat resource. And I really appreciate your observations. You mentioned enforcement and suggesting that, that all enforcement, or something that force enforcement tended to do was to force uh, people underground to become clandestine in their use of the resource base. And I'm wondering if, if there's any empirical uh, research evidence that looks at the actual effectiveness of enforcement with respect to uh, outcomes. Uh, does enforcement actually contribute to sustainable use and management of, of, of wildlife, or does it protect wildlife? Is there, uh, does it, in, in fact, increase uh, contribute to an increasing of illegal poaching because uh, people can only use uh, uh, you know wildlife uh, illegally, if you will. In other words, do we have an evidence? Do we have evidence that, that charts the actual impact of enforcement regimes on outcomes with respect to livestock? Uh, sorry, not wild, wildlife numbers. Um, I really don't know. Uh, we searched the literature and the reports, and I don't find any kind of evidence of, of how law enforcement gives you, provides you some elements of sustainable consumption and trade of bushmeat or harvesting. Um, I think it's an open question that we should try to explore more, to look at more. Um, they probably there is some information, but a lot of the condemning bushmeat consumption and trade is more, as I say, influenced by these conservation ideologies. And, and there is not a lot of evidence. They are more about don't kill Bambi. Okay, we have maybe time for one more question. Yes, please. Bambi might be a crocodile though, but anyway. Uh, is it on? Should I stand up? Okay. Um, Ebola. The la latest argument against bushmeat is about Ebola. Should we do more research on the health aspects of uh, bushmeat? Um, there is a lot. I, um, research in, in zoonotic disease or infectious disease, I think, should be part of C4. Um, defining what what aspect of this 
of the research, what questions will be. It's something that um, we are trying to explore with Robert Nassi and Jen Fa. And one of the experts on zoonotic disease and urban areas coming here is arriving the, the 10th of November. Oscar Pineda, who worked in aeroport disease and zoonotic disease in Mexico and New York. He's a member of the Academy of Science, so the New York Academy of Science. He will be coming here. And we are exploring some possibilities or looking at uh, what we can look at is uh, not just infection paths, but also um, landscape or habitat conversions and, and exposure to zoonotic disease. Okay, I think m maybe we can take one last question if there's a burning, a burning one amongst the crowd. Okay. No. Well, I, I wanted to make a point that you mentioned the issue of social pensions and funds going to rural areas that might help recreate these hunting landscapes. And I think in, in, a, in a recent review we did about cash transfers, we find sometimes the opposite effect where cash to rural areas where there's less excess leads to demand for luxury goods like protein, like cows, and therefore opening up grazing lands. So I guess there can be opposite impacts of cash influxes to rural areas um, and the effects of forests. So I, I, I wonder if there is some conditions or, or factors that might lead to one or the other, if you would like to comment. Yeah, and I think there is a lot of assessments on what social pensions and PAS payment for environmental service are. I think it's a very robust economic analysis of that. Um, there is not a robust information on the environmental impacts of that. But I think it's time to look at more um, decision theories. It's more to build cases, to look at cases, how people are making decisions when they use this money is, as I said, one of the markets should not be only how many people are living in poverty, but also how many people are contributing to the, inverting the process of, of landscape um, conversions and environmental degradation. I think that's one of the rich, rich mind that we need to explore. I invite you to do that. All right. Good. That I think is a, that, that may be a good note for us to end. Can everyone please give a hand to Miguel for a very interesting and wonderful talk? Thank you.